we join our protagonist, Jacob. You know, that guy from the first dozen Transformers films. Being apprehended by Security Bot, Security Bot's twin, and their little human plaything. A guy who looks suspiciously like Darth Vader's adopted son. I have a video on the Force Unleashed too. We're told to go outside and comply. We step outside and find that Security Bot's third twin. Boy, triplets. I bet that pregnant cyborg was saggy. Has captured the little squirrely f who shot down our aircraft. Killed protagonist dude's friend, or maybe more. Um... <gasps> and got us captured by El Boarding, Captain Sam Witwicky the Callisto Protocol. A lot of dumb, offensive and gratuitous jokes lie ahead, equaling the brutality that the Callisto Protocol presents. Sit back, enjoy the jokes, the music, the show, and like, comment and subscribe if you think I've earned it, bitch. Jacob wakes up in what could be a pricey vintage studio apartment in New York. We do the once over twice and become hypnotized by a pink fox that totally isn't gay. But Jacob's dead boyfriend starts looking for a kiss and that totally is gay. Our gays immune to jokes. Jacob wakes up for realsies this time in what could be a luxury hotel, I mean cell, on a planet or a ship, there's really no way you'd know because I cut that part out. We stare directly at the sun to assert dominance. We discover all hell is broken loose and by loose I mean every prisoner's wet dream. There's an alarm ringing, a warm cozy fire going and spotlights on the scene. The only thing missing is for someone to drop the soap. Well, there is security bot's fourth twin. Well, just telling me something I already know. For pacing, I know I should skip the next part, but I'm greedy, it's my video, so I don't. Casually strolling down one half of a flight of stairs, as one does in a fire emergency, we come across a bloke named Elias. And I say bloke because he sounds like he's from a rough part of Britain, and only blokes who are broke say bruv unironically. Hey, bruv! Is going on? Elias tells us he knows this place, he runs these streets, and if we help him, then he'll help us. He offers us a shiv fashioned from hardened feces, and tells us we can use it to hack into the control room. I didn't know feces could be used for such a thing, but I'm not going to argue with a man who fashions shivs out of shit. I take the shit, I mean shiv, but as we leave, he says, hey, don't leave me hanging. I'm shook. Elias, being a person of ambiguous descent, you'd think he'd have a better poor choice of words. I do a slick animation, Tran into the next scene, but skip the next 30 minutes of the game because it's more of the same and I ain't got time for that. You know, a little something like, inmates attack us, we dispatch of one, we dispatch of another. And we get a questionably large toothpick. Blah blah. Running down a corridor, we see a bloody corpse being dragged into the vent. We keep walking and pretend like we didn't see anything, because ignoring the problem makes it go away. We look anyway and can see it was simply a burst pipe carrying red paint to Van Gogh's caravan and definitely not blood. Jacob. Quit playing. You're dead. Did that scare you? It didn't scare me because I have no testicles. My imaginary girlfriend got jealous of my penis, tore them off, and now stores them in a vagina to keep the eggs warm. Arts in communion. We run around a bit more. I search a box. I'm hoping for some spare testicles. But then Jacob hears something crawling around the vent, so turns around and stares at it. Because if you look at your problems, then they just go away. Speaking of going away, these robots won't go away, so now I have to continue numbering them. I sneak past twin number five, and I sneak past twin number six. Apparently robots have selective hearing, because I'm definitely making noise when I cut these things. I get busy looking for more spare parts in a loot box. And to nobody's surprise, Jacob gets caught cheating with a facehugger from Alien. His boyfriend won't be happy about this. Yes, I know he's dead, and he still won't be happy about this. We take a look at what happens when you step out of a room and let robots have their way with humans. I pick up a recording belonging to one Dr. Caitlin Marler. The name sounds familiar, and then I remember she's the witch who fell kinky and strapped us down to stitch a new trick into the back of our neck wrist, that bitch. You know, if I were a girl, I wouldn't be a scientist, I'd be an astronaut, or a gynecologist, but for boys. Maybe then guys would know how uncomfortable of a prospect it is for a 70 year old man to be shoveling about your delicates as if a pig truffle hunting or feeding from a trough, goddamn. I take a listen to the recording, but stop. If I can't listen to these things on the move, then don't force me to choose. I stick a fuse in and out of a socket three times because I'm dumb and I have OCD. That's a lie, I just wanted to seem quirky and relatable. I don't have OCD. That's another lie, I have severe OCD and it's real bad. But in this case I did it three times because I am dumb and I'm trying to save face, unlike Jacob who can't even save his arm. Luckily, Jacob is a lizard, so regrows his arm and uses it to bludgeon one of two infected with his toothpick. The second gets scared of the mean lizard man, so runs away in a sense. We're down bad, so pop a squat and take a shot of heroin. The hit is good, so we keep squatting pop and take another. Urine has never been so useful. I notice a fan spinning incredibly fast, and because I'm a boy and all boys are destructive, I wonder what would happen if I stuck my Willy Wonka in spinning metal going 5 million RPMs. Nothing good. And this saddens me because I wanted chaos. We climb through a bloodied vent, drop down into a quiet room, 
broom and find a new toy. But before Jacob can unzip and unsheath his own toy, we're interrupted by a ghoul. Unacceptable. We jump forward to Jacob's head being crushed as if elephant stepping on watermelon. Gibble gobble. I jump forward again as I found that disturbing and I'm now side-eyeing the developers. Debbie, save me. I turn and front eye the developers as they introduce a device which gives me the power of the force from Star Wars. But who needs Star Wars when you can go to Army Hammer's butchery, home to the finest human tenders alive except dead, a delicacy? We try to play Viva Piñata, but the physics aren't quite there, and it's only half a body, meaning half the fun. Some snake with a face, who isn't Giselle Bunchen that lives in a hole that resembles an anus, attacks us, undoubtedly getting last night's dinner juices all up on us. And now I finally understand why Tom Brady cared more about football than marriage, and why Giselle divorced him for dishonoring commitment. She liked it messy. We find ourselves in industrial downtown LA, like a hot girl and that we must fight off decrepit hobos and their unwanted pretentious advances. And by hot girl I mean intelligent hot girl and by hobos I mean all boys. I imagine that sometimes these girls would rather just kill themselves than have to deal with another day of the same old bullshit. Talking about girls and boys and their bullshit, we encounter attempted double suicide again. She says hey, much like girls at the gym wish they could respond, when some ugly ass, rat looking incel with giant biceps and a peg leg dares to approach her and attempt to speak at her. She'll throw you in a cage where you belong, where you can shrink back to your default, two decades deep malnourishment and atrocious hygiene. You don't brush your teeth or wash daily or dress nicely. You're not ambitious, you're stupid. Why even get mad when girls want nothing to do with you, loose screw? Beggars can't be choosers and clever hot girls don't couple up with losers. Because I currently operate the moral high ground, I make Jacob stop for a moment and reflect by looking out the window. Boy, it looks cold out there, and I'm sure glad I'm not out there. In the dark of a night, in the midst of a storm, struggling, traipsing around in the snow, skipping forward and now we join Jacob, battling through the heat of the Arabian desert. All this sand and no water, I worry for the protagonist. Look, over there, a shady figure in the thick of the mist. Hopefully it's a local so we can ask for directions and then get the wrong directions. It's definitely a local, what with the foul mood, screeching about how foreigners are a blight and how all invaders are categorically lesser humans who are ugly bottom feeders, yada yada. They themselves have missing teeth and gums leaking rotten gunk and no so crooked even incest sinners couldn't look twice. And in entire face and body more akin to a rodent than the perfect human specimen they have convinced themselves to be. This is what they are. All the while pretending outsiders are stealing all the jobs, the jobs they don't want. Sound familiar? Come on. Elias has a quick nap in the snow and by nap I mean sleep and by sleep I mean dead. Danny, the humanoid squirrel, rolls up on a sick ride, only to ravage Elias' still lukewarm corpse for data. Now I'm not a rabbit doctor, but I'd say typical squirrel behaviour. Presumably being the last two people in the biome, you'd think they'd stay together to be warm and get cosy. But Danny has issues with Jacob, and Jacob isn't man enough to grab that shorty by the scruff of her neck and demand answers. So Danny walks all over him, closes up shop, and just rolls on out of there. If Apple were given time, I'm certain they could make this machine copy and paste iPhones. I also use the machine as a distraction to slip back to an earlier part of the game. But Apple would be losing customers as I'd only ever buy an iPhone that's been expertly assembled with the delicate touch of a seven-year-old child paid minus one dollars a day. This staircase represents a child's endless despair. Jacob drops down in what seems to be a feces mixture. Yuck. I mean yum because Jacob's now crawling in it so that must mean that he loves it. We see a like-minded fellow bathing in the filth, but before we can shit on them, they're snatched up into the air by Chuck Berry's spirit. Google it. I turn and shimmy back to the basin of crap, because I'd rather die of hepatitis than be the plaything of a hoe past their prime. The game is a mean bully who makes bad faith jokes about those hoes that work the streets. I crawl back so I can progress and slide Jacob through more vents. Another crate and still no testicles. One lever, two lever, three. And because I like numbering things now, we just killed a room of infected. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The devs tried to groom me with tentacle play. No. I fish around some dude's neck for a key code. After keying in the code, I start counting sheep while waiting for the tank to drain. But the camera pans dramatically to human gummy bears wrapped in threads of spindled webs. And you and I both know what's going to happen next. It's just pop, pop, pop. We cross a sky fi bridge, climb a sky fi ladder. I seize the opportunity to chop off Granny's hand and fingers because she lingered too long when grabbing my soft cheek. We shimmy down a normal ladder seemingly forever and ever, hitting the bottom of a bottomless pit I know something up. Everything's looking way too cinematic. It's a sewer. Goes one direction and there's nothing in sight. I wouldn't be surprised if this dank pipe turned into a water slide ride. Oh, but instead it's filled. Disease infested, AIDS inducing, deadly. 
feel. Welcome to Universal's new park ride. If disease doesn't kill you, these metal fans will. Seriously, why are there fans here? To waft the Buddhist thing downstream? It's already on a down slope. Well, at least Jacob's having fun. And with only a short life ahead, this is time well spent. That's a Universal guarantee, baby. What a ride. We come across a McDonald's meat processing factory. It's a party for taste buds, modern meats made into delicious mulch. You know, pork, beef, horse, hen, three, two, one. Back in the future, Jacob's still battling the snowy storm, crossing a treacherous bridge, clinging on for dear life. He's surviving, but for how long? I can't help but think, wouldn't it just be easier to accidentally fall and then fall asleep forever? But that's just my lazy ass for you. I fight off granny. She's angry about something. Flick a switch and end up in a mine. I take this moment to appreciate the ambience, the atmosphere, the environment. The game looks good but doesn't run well, much like British girls before they turn 20. Jacob descends one whole flight of stairs. We bump into Grumpy Pants again, being all smooth and shit. She already knows she needs Jacob's help with her plan, but she plays it cool. Makes it seem as if it's his idea and his choice. Because if a man believes that he is the one who leads, then he's much more likely to do anything you want. We already saved her by assisting her and killing a bunch of hobos running rampant the buggy bay, but then she has us running off to open up the hangar doors. Do I get to open her hangar doors? We're putting ourselves at risk in danger, because you see, men are not special, important, not the prize. And if you think about it historically, really, quite expendable. Beaches of Normandy, etc, etc. Bam, we're in a vehicle, down to boogie. Speeding through the snow towards the hangar, then a plane, then freedom. But wait a minute. Nut Gobbler takes a detour, a detour to Jacob's ship. Danny exits and we follow her. Damn woman, be the death of me, the death of me. What was that? Coming, darling. Slowly, though, because I ain't letting no acorn hoarder tell me what to do. She tells us to open a box. Jacob asks why and she says, because I said so. Okay, girls really do believe this is an adequate reason to get anything they want and the defaced dead boyfriend shows up to call Jacob a bitch. I agree. Jacob, use a bitch. By way of miracle, we make it to the top of the hangar and cool down the ship. This bald bastard shows up and starts monologuing with his two monocles wearing ass saying, Oh, uh, well actually, two monocles instead of glasses are in fashion. You'd know that if you weren't 2020 vision freaks. Then he says something like, I'm impressed you made it this far, blah blah, but there's too much at stake here, blah blah. You can't leave and the protocol cannot be broken blah 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 Jacob! the end is not the end is not the end is nigh for Jacob, however will he survive? Defy physics and stop this stupid free fall fly? Well, sure, but not really. This game seems to enjoy dropping Jacob from heights, as any sane parent would accidentally drop an unwanted child, saved from a life of kisses from granny. I notice that these musty old street workers only attack if they hear sound. We squat down and squeeze past, trying not to fart. Jacob is stupid. He has limited intelligence being a man, never understood basic etiquette. So, silence doesn't last very long and he receives an appropriate punishment fit for the crime of puppy booty blowing. We've booked a free pass riding the subway. The unwantables try to bum a ride, but we say, hmm, no way. Free things only come to main characters. And we've had snakes on a plane. I guess this would be zombies on a train. Anyone? Yeah? No? Okay. We also get hit on by a two-headed heifer. Hmm. It's all sneak here, climb this ladder, go into this room and this room too. Don't wake the babies. Then die to an explosive toddler. We come across Danny hooking up Avatar style to a rotten corpse. I'm kinky, but this is a foot in the grave too far. We disrupt Danny and she's disturbed, lashing out and striking us. Now this is much more up my butt crack, I mean Ali. Can you call me a coward too? Tell me I'm not man enough to sew deep. Say it. I remember that I'm recording this and none of this is actually happening and that I've suggested I have some sort of humiliation fetish. Well, I could take it out, but I don't and didn't, which I suppose is really quite telling if you think about it. I throw another two-headed heifer into the mix to distract you. Here's Jacob falling again, discombobulate. This dome is a perky breast with no nipple and nothing more. Dr. Caitlin Marler shows up to represent in hologram form. She explains the infection is a result of mixing giant alien space fish DNA with inmates from the purpose-built prison on planet Callisto, all to make some sort of super soldier, Batman, Spider-Man, Ant-Man, Tuna Man, you know the stories. In an unexpected crossover, that nine-foot god from Prometheus shows up, comes running at us like a freight train, but with arms and legs, so not a freight train. How does one beat a nine-inch god plastic? Or just a lack of motivation, I don't know which is more believable. Danny receives an unexpected IVF treatment. Gross. We deny Danny the mercy of death because Danny is a queen, the queen needs food, the queen makes babies, the babies get more food, the queen needs more food, the queen makes more babies, comprende? Security bots 7th and 8th twin. 
we're gently carried back to our cell, right back where we started. Dr. Marla comes in on the comms. She has Danny, tells us to find a lab and she can help. I'm skeptical, but then the gates slide open, so we Gucci. I'm reminded why nightclubbing is a trifling affair. We come face to face with a fought and are forced to fight her off and escape or we'll suffocate. Ugh. This is a front row seat to our cell room. Great. Now the whole world knows I put a finger in my butt. It's like we hit a time capsule and landed in 1939 in a certain German party's laboratory. Nasty business. Bippity boppity boo. Marla is found and Danny too. Marla is trying to slow Danny's infection. She tells us the Callisto Protocol is the 90 for God who can't even break a window. To save Danny, we need they them's DNA to create a serum. Before we go, she says, hey, come look at my school art project. Baby, you crazy. Could they have found a more sci-fi way to open doors? Jacob and Danny make it to the part of the prison where Donald Trump will stay once the Dems finally get their way and remove him from his beloved country club, a place where people come and go, meaning Donald will always have friends. But, much like the Dems in that case, we've hit a brick wall. Clearly we've been transported to Tokyo. I know it's Tokyo because it's perpetually dark, there's neon lights everywhere and a noodle shop to spare, and I'm surrounded by so many tight-packed buildings it's basically a concrete jungle claustrophobia included. Every western depiction of Tokyo ever. Turns out we're in Danny's memory, the doctor synced us up. And it's nice to have such a strong connection with our new bestie. Anyway, we ditch Danny as it's her time of the month to be hysterical. Walk slowly up a winding hall because it's cool, cinematic, and interrupt the warden talking to a bunch of walnuts this man is a crackpot. He demands we fight his experiment in a case of survival of the fittest. It is a gift. We win because the main character always wins. We jab the withered pickle, steal the juice, mixing the serum to save Danny. The warden actually activates self-destruct because he's a sore loser and so it's a quick dash to the escape pods. Now, there's only one pod and if it were me, boy, that bitch would already be thrown off the building. Kidding. So anyway, Jacob shoves her into the pod and along with the test tube baby they fly off and we call it a day.